Okay, so um, hopefully you heard some application of waveforms, yes, uh, and you heard some examples of it. Uh, what did she say about waveforms overall, though, in terms of as the source of your timbre explorations? I mean, what was her overall assessment of those basic waveforms? <laughs> Yeah, hard to differentiate, right? Listen to your, your ears. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think her assessment, I think, is right in terms of listen to your ears before you look at the oscilloscope. And I think that's maybe one advantage we'll have in logic is that you're not, you won't be looking at an oscilloscope for these sounds. You're going to be guided by your ears in terms of what sounds good, what's going to um, uh, give you a difference. But the controls are situated where they're uh, informed by those oscilloscope patterns, triangle, sawtooth, sine wave, those types of things. Okay, So you're going to see some of those things show up, uh, but the ultimate decision maker for you in terms of which sound goes and which one sa stays should be your ear, not the oscilloscope. Okay. Um, she mentions that they're also, I mean, we, uh, we were using this term building blocks, right? Okay. Uh, she, her assessment is that they're very basic, like uh, flavors, right? So like salty, sweet, those sorts of things. But uh, even within sweetness, right, there's a difference between, I don't know, uh, a Hershey's Kiss and a Skittle, yes? Okay, those are two different forms of sweetness, right? Um, so that sort of thing is where she gets into kind of the orchestration bit. And the, uh, what other thing does she say is more important to our perception of, of differences in, in timbres? We talked about it in the intro when I was introducing the terminology. The actual envelope. Enveloping, yeah. Enveloping is very key to our differences in, in timbre, okay? Uh, right at the end, she introduces one other set of terminology that I overlooked. Uh, I mean, right at the end, uh, using this word phonic and some prefixes to phonic. Polyphonic and monophonic. What does that mean? Oh, I was thinking polyphonic. You said monophonic. Polyphonic yep. is when you have more than one sound doing different things, like at the same time. Yeah. Whether it's homophonic is together. Like if you were to play chords on a piano and keep the same spacing the whole time together. Right. That would be homophonic, whereas right. polyphonic is and just all different parts at once. Well, and you're talking about it in turn. In your like those terms show up in music theory. Yeah. Yes. So if you've had music theory, you're going to be taking music theory. Polyphony Monophonic and polyphonic show up there. They have a little bit different usage in synthesizer speak. Yeah. Um, at least, like from what I know in synthesizers, um, polyphonic means you can play chords. You can play more than one note yeah. at the same time. Whereas monophonic is a single note at any given time. Yeah. So a, a monophonic synthesizer is only capable of playing one note at a time, one pitch at a time. Okay. A polyphonic synthesizer is capable of playing multiple pitches at a time, multiple sounds at a time. Okay, uh, that's a key distinction. Early synthesizers were monophonic, just as a technical limitation. Okay, but there are now still synthesizers on the market and software synthesizers that we'll see in Logic that are intentionally limited to being monophonic. So if you try to program chords for a monophonic synthesizer, what's going to happen? Yeah, it's going to pick one note. Okay, and you're only going to hear one note. Okay, and if you don't understand what's going on, you're going to think that it's broken, but it's an intentional limitation of a monophonic synthesizer, okay? There's a funny, uh, I think it's uh, Keith Wakeman or Emerson, I can't remember, one of these uh, prog rock keyboardists uh, from the UK, uh, he uh, tells a funny story that he bought his first Moog from a guy who insisted that it was broken because it could only play one note at a time, but that was an intentional, that was a technical limitation of the synthesizers at the time that it could only do that. Her solution was what? Wendy Carlos' solution was what? She mentioned something that we've been working with, yes? Multitracking, yes? Multitracking is one way to overcome monophonic limitations, or you could use a polyphonic synthesizer, okay? So let's start looking at some software synths in logic, okay? And we're going to do this uh, pretty quickly, and you're going to do a little homework assignment based on this. I actually sent out a, a link. Let's see here. Hide that via Twitter, so if you haven't popped on the Twitter feed uh, right here, okay, this hasn't showed up on Blackboard yet, but I've got a link here to a, a logic session that I want you to use as a starting point, okay? So if you go to twitter.com slash profwallach, 
the latest tweet right here from two hours ago uh, is a session that I want you to download. Okay, it should download. Let's see what, what happens when you click on this. Does it go? Okay, there it is. It's only 2.4 megabytes, so it should download pretty quickly. Everybody know how to find zip files once they are downloaded onto your desktop or into the downloads folder? If, the, if it's missing, there should be something. I'm in Chrome. It has a little uh, drop down list that says show in Finder. It'll show you where that zip file actually showed up, actually downloaded. Okay. Uh, if you're in uh, Firefox or something else, there should be something like a downloads option in the window where you can find it. Okay. Yeah. It's on the Twitter feed here. It says logic session for today's demo. Yep. That should download. Okay. So you should have a zip file. You should be able to, uh, if you copy it to the desktop and unzip it, you'll see a, f a folder much like this. And let me get rid of some of these folders on my desktop here. Okay. So. What do you notice about this project folder, much like the project folder from Pro Tools? It's got backups, audio files. Yeah, you've got subfolders here, right? Okay. So much like Pro Tools where we had a, a session file and then we had a folder structure around that, Logic has a similar structure, okay? Be aware of this. Keep your folder intact and make sure you copy all of these files around when you're backing up your project, okay? For our purposes today, you want to double click this, this where it says unit 3 underscore march 12 lo dot logic, okay, and that should launch the project. Take note of something for me. Do, when you launched, did it say 64 bit here or 32 bit? I'm curious. 32. It says 32. Ooh, okay. Let's fix that right now since you're all out of machine, okay? Because these are 64 bit machines. You should be able to run this in 64 bit mode, okay? Go ahead and quit logic, okay? You need to go to the hard drive. Go to Applications, so click on the hard drive, click on Applications, scroll down to where Logic Pro is, okay, don't double click it, just click it to highlight it, okay, once you've clicked to highlight it, go ahead and hit Apple I, and there should be an option here on this window that pops up that says open in 32-bit mode, you want to uncheck that. Because you're on 64-bit machines, it'll be a little bit nicer, a little bit faster, a little bit better. Okay? So I just basically highlighted Logic Pro. I hit Apple I or Command I and unchecked this option that says open in 32-bit mode. It'll run in 32-bit mode, but because we have 64-bit machines, why limit ourselves, right? Okay? So uh, I don't know why they decided to make that the default for Logic Pro 9, but they did. Okay, so this is a very basic session, okay? It has three tracks of MIDI loops, okay? The loop is enabled. You can tell by this green bar at the top of the screen here, okay? And also this button right here, which is the loop button, okay? If you hit play right now, it should not make any sound, correct? Yes, okay. That's because all three of the tracks are muted. I did that intentionally because... I have, in, I have loaded the most basic of Logic in, uh, instruments on each one of these tracks, that being the test oscillator, okay? The test oscillator doesn't even have an envelope. In fact, the test oscillator doesn't even pay attention to durations, and so if you unmute these tracks and then stop the playback, the test oscillator will continue, okay? Some of you are unmuting the tracks, and that's fine, but you'll notice that, hey... Okay, this is my wonderful little uh, variation on Pachelbel, whatever-ish, Canon here, okay? So if I unmute this track, I'll turn it down a little bit. Great, okay? But if I hit stop now, it's going to stick, okay? So the test oscillator doesn't even know anything about duration. It only knows frequency, okay? So that's a problem. That's why these are all muted by default, because I didn't want this to boot up and then have <laughs> squirting out of you, okay? So, okay, this is kind of our starting point, okay? I want to point out a few things that are similar yet different from Pro Tools, okay? One is that we're in a window called the 
a range window, okay? In Pro Tools, this was referred to as the edit window, yeah? Okay, so the, the, the Pro Tools equivalent would be the edit window, okay? This is our arrange window, okay? So if you, you, you might catch me sometimes referring to it as the edit window, but technically in logic, it's the arrange window, okay? Uh, in the Pro Tools, the other main window we used was what? Yeah. The mix window, right? Okay. If you go to window, you can actually open up the mixer window. Okay. So a little bit different there. And it'll give you a separate window. It'll show you all the tracks that are available. Okay. What do you notice about the, uh, well, let's see. In Pro Tools, when we started a project, uh, we started with no tracks. Now, I've started this project with three tracks. But we already, by default, have a master track. So remember in Pro Tools, I had to actually have you add a master track in order to add a fade or a fade out to the beginning of your project. In Logic, you start with a master track by default. Okay, It's already there for you, output and master. Okay, Go ahead and close that. We're not going to work in the mix window for this uh, little uh, demo here. Uh, I want to show you. Okay, So I've already mentioned the test oscillator. We, In addition to the mix window, we also have a little mixer to the side here. Okay, everybody see that? Okay, this is our uh, inspector panel. Okay, so we can expect various things here. Uh, and as you click on the different tracks, you should notice that it changes just ever so slightly. Let's see. Okay, one of them is, one of them is mono. The instrument three is mono. Great. That's fine. Okay. But you should see down here in the corner that this inst2, inst1 changes. This, bit, this little mini mixer is always going to show you whatever track is highlighted at any given moment. Okay, So it can save you from going back and forth between the mix, mixer window and the arrange window. It can, you can just use this little mixer over to the side. Okay, So click on instrument 1 to highlight it. Then go down here where it says test os. Okay. That's where you're actually going to change your software instrument. I want you to click there and choose the option which is ESM. Yeah, right where it says test OS. If you click and hold, you can change it to ESM. And that's going to bring up a window for you. Okay. I'm going to move that over to the side here. Click on now instrument 2. And you notice that now it's it's back to saying test OS because that's what I have as the default. Okay, go ahead and on that one click where it says test OS and change it to ESP, not to be confused with the what was it, uh, the the ability to read people's minds, right? Okay, ESP, which is the polyphonic synth. I, what, it's very helpful. I mean, we, we mentioned monophonic and polyphonic. Right away, you see that those that distinction is showing up here. Yes. Okay. So we have these two synthesizers open. If one of them is monophonic, the ESM, and one of them is polyphonic, what should we assume is the difference between these two? The primary difference between these two. Yeah. One can only play one note at a time. One can only play one can play two notes or multiple notes at a time. Okay. So, uh, what do you notice about these? I've, I've mentioned, uh, I've shown you some graphs of uh, waveforms. I've shown you some abbreviations. Where do you see those show up here? Let's talk first about waveforms. Do you see some pictures of waveforms in these interfaces? Yes. Yes, where? In the ESM. Yeah, this wheel here, okay. So square, okay. So we've got a sawtooth and a square, and we've got something that's labeled mix at the top. What do you? What do we think that if one end of the dial is a sawtooth, the other one is a square? What do you? And the top of it says mix. What do you think that means? Yeah. If we turn it all the way to the left, we're going to get a sawtooth. If we turn it all the way to the right, we're going to get a square. And if we mix it somewhere in between, we're going to get a mixture of the two. So if I I put that on instrument one, if I go back to my arrange window, which I can't do. Because these are in, these are always going to float on top. Okay, here I unmute this one, which is the ESM track. Lovely. Okay, and now I start to move this. There's a sawtooth. There's a square wave. And I can mix between them. Okay. Now if I mute this one again and I go to my ESP track, okay, where do I see waveforms on here? 
Well, that's enveloping, yes? Yeah, you've got faders here. Okay, and one of them is even labeled noise. This, these two are the hardest to see. It's actually a square wave, but you have a negative 1 underneath the bracket, and then you have a negative 2 underneath the bracket. If you, you might have to get real close to the monitor to see those. I know I did, okay? But if I hit play now after unmuting this, okay, I've got some nice short notes, okay? Turn down this one. I should expect that it's going to change. Turn this one up. Basically, what you're doing, you've got six different waveforms that you can mix in different ratios. Okay? That's what they're showing you there. Okay, so let's jump back to uh, enveloping, right? Where do you see enveloping on these two windows? Say again? Ah, yeah, and the ESP, you've got explicitly the letters A, D, S, R, okay? You can make changes there to the, to the amplitude decay sustained release, okay? On the ESM, it's a little less apparent, but you do have some things called decay, yes? Okay, you can use that to get some enveloping effects, and I see that we're out of time, okay? So this is what I'm going to have to show you for now, okay? Uh, we'll pick up here on uh, Thursday, but where I want you to go with this, okay, homework for Thursday. Do read the Merez Liberation of Sound. Do read the Synthesis Basics link, okay? Um, make sure you've got these categories and some vocabulary that we talked about in these, okay? Waveforms, the different types of waveforms, the control signals, enveloping, ADSR, that type of stuff, and basic filter types. Okay, those are the kind of the, the terminology that I've highlighted for you today. Um, that will be reinforced here in the Synthesis Basics link. Okay, the homework assignment I wanted to give you, but I don't think I got quite far enough. If you if you're feeling adventurous and you want to start working with this project, okay, create a little electronic orchestration of this. Okay, I'll add to your skills on Thursday, and we'll make this a weekend homework assignment. This electronic orchestration of this little loop that I've gave you. Okay, so this is not due for Thursday. Okay. Electronic orchestration, but if you're if you're feeling adventurous, start working with this material and start fleshing it out. Okay, um, heads up for next Tuesday. You're going to need to pick a video for your final project for this unit that you're going to create a musical accompaniment with. So if you want to start looking at Creative Commons videos or you want to start filming a video yourself, you can start doing that for next Tuesday. And be looking at sections five and seven in the audio culture. That's the experimental and the minimal sections of the book. We're going to talk a little bit about that next week, okay? So that's a heads up on your homework, okay? But for Thursday, the thing you need to do, these readings, okay? I will see you all then. Bye. <laughs>